full of information and opinions. But in the midst of that, in the midst of all the clanging noise, we long to hear a word of wisdom. We long to hear a word from God. Let us pray. God, we come here today to learn wisdom from your word, from your Holy Spirit, and from one another. We have come so that wisdom may call us out of our darkness and into the light. We have come to have the deeper, richer, wisdom-filled life that you have promised to each of us. Amen. There is a sure source of silver, a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth, rock is smelted into copper. Humans put an end to darkness, dig for ore to the farthest depths, into stone in utter darkness. Open a shaft from, away from any inhabitant, places forgotten by those on foot. Apart from any human, they hang sway. Earth, from it comes food. Is turned over below ground as by fire. Its rocks are the source for lapis lazuli. There is gold dust in it. A path. No bird of prey knows it. A hawk's eye has seen it. Proud beasts have been trodden on it. A lion has crossed over it. Humans thrust their hand into flint, pull up mountains from their roots, cut channels into rocks. Their eyes see everything precious. They dam up sources of rivers. Hidden things come to light. But wisdom, where can it be found? Where is the place of understanding? Humankind does not know its value. It isn't found in the land of the living. The deep says it is not with me. The sea says not alongside me. It cannot be bought with gold. Its price can't be measured in silver can't be weighed against gold from Ophir with precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor glass can compare with it. She can't be acquired with gold jewelry. Coral and jasper shouldn't be mentioned. The price of wisdom is more than rubies. Cushite Toba has won't compare with her. She can't be set alongside pure gold. But wisdom, where does she come from? Where is the place of understanding? She's hidden from the eye of all the living, concealed from birds of the sky. Destruction and death have said, we heard a report of her. God understands her way. God knows her place. For God looks to the ends of the earth and surveys everything beneath the heavens in order to weigh the wind, to prepare a measure of for waters. When God made a decree for the rain, a path for thunderbolts, then God observed it, spoke of it, established it, searched it out, and said to humankind, Look, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. Turning from evil is understanding. The book of Job asks big questions. Why do people suffer? We like to ask big questions. Why did my friend get cancer and get treatment and die, but my neighbor had cancer and treatment and lived? Why did the Holocaust happen? 
Why did they allow the genocide in Rwanda? Why are there people starving around the world when we have enough food to feed everyone? Why did Job lose everything? We like to ask big questions, especially if you're like me, because that's why I decided to study philosophy. Because you got to ask amazing questions about how we were to live our lives, how we were to organize ourselves as people, what the world should look like, should be. So when I was studying philosophy, I always had a soft spot in my heart for Plato. Because Plato believed there was truth, that there was a there was a wisdom to the world and the earth and to our lives that you could discover. Now, he didn't think we all saw it. In fact, he thought many of us were blind to it and never even caught very much of a glimpse of it. But he believed that there were certain facts, reality, truth that could be discovered. Because when you compare that to the new philosophers they were having us read, like Derrida and Foucault, Derrida said there is no truth. Everything is relative. Nothing can be discovered. Everyone has their own truth, their own understanding. And my brain went, but some of them are wrong. So how can their truth be true? Which is why I think Joe gets to this point. He's lost everything. He's sat Shiva for all he has lost, sitting in quiet and silence. And then he's had an argument with his friends about what truth is, about what wisdom is, about who God is, about why people suffer. And what he's heard back from them is that he needs to repent and turn around and turn back to God because he is a sinful creature and he did something wrong. And Job, at the end of his discussion with those three friends, has these four chapters in this section that we're in right now. 27, 28, 29, 30. That he talks about his disagreement with them. But he talks about it to ask, where is the place of wisdom? How do we find out what's true? Like me, that 18-year-old who said, boy, Plato makes a lot of sense because some of these people have it really, really wrong, so there must be a truth out there. Of course, I wanted it to be my truth. And Job wants to find that same thing. He wants to find his wisdom. He wants to find out where the place of truth and wisdom is to find out how this could have happened to him, how it was possible. And so in this chapter that we're reading in the midst of that discussion, he asks about wisdom. And he starts it by having this description about what humans have used their technology to find, what they've used their abilities to gather, right? So he talks about how humans have explored the deepest parts of the earth, digging out the gold and the silver, finding precious metals and copper and iron ore, finding things of value and importance. They have dug deep, but in that digging, in that technology, they didn't find wisdom. They didn't find truth. They didn't find what they were actually looking for. I think about this a lot because some of us are very addicted to our phones. And so when we want to know something, so for some of you, that may be your grandkids or your nieces and nephews. They pull out their phone and they either say, Siri, and then ask the question, or 
if you're like me and you don't like to talk to your phone, you type in your question and it gives me back an answer. So I typed in wisdom, right? How many answers do you think are possible for that question? I could have spent years trying to find an answer to wisdom with all that Google had given me about what I could find. It gives us lots of stuff, lots of information, lots of news. But does it give us what we're actually searching for? Does it give us the actual information that we want? Or are we just bombarded with so much information that we don't know what to do with it? Because when you Google wisdom, if you, like me, because I'm always a pastor researching sermons, type sermon after it, it gives me all sorts of sermons that I want nothing to do with. If you type it because you want to know what its definition is, you still get pages of definitions and wisdom. So how do we dis discover what wisdom is? Job says that God took on this search for us. That God has moved through everything and every time trying to discover everything there is to know. That God has looked at the highest places, has been in the storm clouds, has been in the place where we plow up the earth. That God has searched everywhere, has observed everything, has looked far and wide. And what God discovered was mystery. That God discovered that the answer to our question, why do people suffer? The answer to our search for truth and wisdom is always necessarily incomplete. Because what you end up with in your search is what is common for the day. You end up, even if you go to the most exciting, newest speakers that there are to find. The people who have done the best research have thoroughly examined it. Even if you go to them, they've caught just a glimpse, just a sliver. And so what Job argues is that wisdom and God is this mystery and thread that weaves throughout all of creation. That God and wisdom are found in the act of creating and being created. That wisdom is not an end product. It's something that's going to evolve and change. So his friends, they were sharing wisdom. They were sharing what they had learned from their families, from their culture. They were sharing what they had learned from their faith. That the reason you suffer is because God has caused it, because you have sinned. And they shared that wisdom back. And Job's like on the cutting edge, right? And he says, but that doesn't work. That answer doesn't hold water for me. Because I know that I didn't do the things you said I did. And if I didn't do the things you said I did, are you sure that all those other people out there that are suffering are also sinful? And so he comes up against that edge, right? That broken spot, that spot where what was believed as truth is no longer a complete and truthful answer, is no longer fulfilling. And let me tell you, that's an uncomfortable spot. And guess what? That's where we are today. We are in a very, very uncomfortable place. We are in a place where what we thought we knew and understood is being challenged. And we don't know what the wisdom answer or the truth answer is yet. 
we're in the in-between spot. As one of the speakers that I heard this week at our TPIRC conference says, we're in a liminal space. A space where we had thought we had fixed things, right? We had thought after the 60s that we had solved the problem of racism. We had thought after the 70s that Ruth Bader Ginsburg came along and fixed the problem of sex for us as a classification. But we're in a spot where those fixes don't work anymore. Those answers that they found and discovered about racism and sexism aren't complete because now we have new information. We have new people that are in the midst of questioning the answers that we thought we had found. And we don't know what the outcome will be. And it's making us all very, very uncomfortable. So what do we do? How do we determine the wisdom that we're supposed to follow? The wisdom that should lead us and guide us? How do we determine where to go in this space that feels so discombobulated and upsetting? And I wish I could say to you, here is the truth. What I can say to you is here's what I know about God. Here's what I know about what Jesus taught us about who we're to be. Here's what I know that Jesus said wisdom was. Jesus told us that wisdom was loving your neighbor. Jesus told us that wisdom was loving your enemy. Jesus told us that wisdom was loving God with everything you have. Where we bump up against the edge of Jesus is do we want to love our enemies? Do we want to love those neighbors that really don't agree with us? And that's why I like Job's chapter, because it says to us that you're going to weave your way through this. You're going to find the thread of God in the midst of this liminal space. You're going to find that piece of hope and wisdom and love and follow it. But it's going to be an incomplete answer. That your job is to continue learning. Because when it gets to the end of the chapter, it says, God says back, look, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. The shunning of evil is understanding. Well, that just explained it all, didn't it? Y'all now know what you have to do. So what does fear of the Lord mean? So if this was a Baptist church, I could tell you what fear of the Lord meant, right? Because fear of the Lord is you need to toe the line or you are going to be going to eternal damnation. This isn't a Baptist church. We don't go there. We believe that everybody can be redeemed. Everybody is saved. Everybody is loved. And that means what is our fear of the Lord? Because it isn't a black and white fear. It isn't a do the right thing or go to hell. It's more complicated. So maybe fear of the Lord isn't an actual thing. Maybe when we translate the word, we're seeing it wrong. Because maybe the fear is that fear that Moses had, right? When he's there at the burning bush and it speaks to him and he's trembling it's fear because you're in the presence of the holy it's fear because you're experiencing awe and wonder and reverence and you can't help but know that everything 
is different than what you expected it to be. That God, the holy, is different than what you expected it to be. And so your fear is not being adequate enough, not knowing enough, not being comfortable enough. But then we get to the second part. If you want understanding, you need to shun evil. So, how many of you remember the promises you made at baptism? Sherry's not here, so she's the only one who could say, yeah, I know. So how many of you remember that same promise that you made at confirmation? The first question you are asked is, will you renounce the powers of evil? Will you renounce the powers of evil? And then you get asked, do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and understanding, to show love and justice, witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? We made it part of what it means to become a Christian, to renounce the powers of evil, to fight injustice and evil, oppression and evil. And that makes it a big question for us as Christians. Because what if we have different understandings of what evil is? When we look at the world, what if we see the world and what I believe is evil is not what you think is evil. That's why it gets hard. And that's why Job ultimately gives us that answer that it's mystery. That wisdom is mystery. That wisdom is going to leave us uncomfortable because there is always something new and more that we can learn. And our job, then, as humans, is to take on that challenge, to learn those things that make us slightly uncomfortable, that make us question some of those things that we thought for, for sure, for true, were the actual fact. To question it. So I wish I could say to you, Job gives us a good answer, and everything is going to be fine. And that he found wisdom. But what he found was questions. And maybe that's what we need right now in this place where everything is topsy-turvy. Where what we thought was reality is now turning out to not be true. Where we don't quite understand everything that's happening. Maybe Job's answer, maybe God's answer, is what we need to search, to observe, to look. When we do that, we come closer to those bits of wisdom that we know and we've been taught since we were little, that you need to love God with everything you have. Love your neighbor with everything you have. And love your enemy, even when it is hard. Amen.
I invite you to close your eyes and to breathe in deeply. I invite you to breathe in peace and to breathe out love. To breathe in the peace of Christ and to breathe out the love of God. Eternal God, we live in a time of considerable confusion. We ask today for your wisdom. We live in a time of peril, of floods and fires and hurricanes, of unrest, of different and competing interests striving for our attention and loyalty. Help us, O oh God, to pray for wise and discerning spirits. Give us wisdom to know good from evil. Give us wisdom to assess the clamoring voices and concerns with which we are daily bombarded. Give us wisdom so that we might learn to be accepting of all the diverse people you have created. Give us wisdom to be peacemakers and mediators of understanding where there is conflict. Give us wisdom when we are in conflict to make it possible, both for us and for those with whom we differ, to save face and win and move forward hand in hand. Give us wisdom not to violate any of your creatures by discriminating against them. Give us wisdom to discern what is of ultimate value and to make wise choices. And Holy God, we stop here and now and ask for your presence on those who've come to us with their prayers. We lift up Jamie and we lift up Jennifer who wanted us to pray for her neighbor Donna. We lift up those we know who are unable to move about the world. We lift up those who are struggling with addiction. We lift up those who are lonely, those who are wanting something more and different. We lift up those who are facing the loss of their jobs, we lift up the healthcare workers and those who are suffering from illnesses. May you continue to be a healing presence in their midst. Oh God, give us wisdom. Oh God, give us understanding. Oh God, give us the power of love as we pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holy wisdom, we want to walk the path of generosity, but something holds us back. We are fearful. We don't know how much money we will need, how much money we can spare. Guided by your spirit, confident in your voice, show us the way. 
We give these gifts faithfully, joyfully. Amen. And if nobody's called you today, then I don't know. Remember that God loves you and always will. That Jesus loves you and always will. That I love you and always will. And may you find that wonderful mystery that is the God of love. Amen.